And I yeah. know Pastor Orton and the Holy Spirit have been neck oh, and neck all yes. week here, just uh, climbing us up for what we need to be traveling through this world. So we're going to let the Holy Spirit and Pastor Art bring us to work. Amen. Good morning, everybody. We have started the service outright. We came in half hour before service. And we prayed over the church. We had the prayer team come in and pray over every pew, over every room, over the church, over the community, over everything. We welcomed this Holy Spirit into the house. And then we go. We went into a time of praise and worship. And thank you, worship team, for ushering it in, ushering in the Holy Spirit, ushering in an attitude of worship and praise and glory. That's where our hearts need to be all the time. I know it's not easy. I know that Wednesday comes around and we're dragging our feet. Just keep praising. Just keep giving it all to him because that's what it's all about. If we listen to that song and we say, hallelujah, he's such a good father and such a good friend. That's yes. all the time. Your friends and your parents don't just leave you. They stay with you. And he's better even than them. He's stronger even than them. So hold tight to that. Hold tight to that throughout the week. And as you go through the struggles, as you go through the frustrations, know that yeah. he is there for you so yes. we're going to keep oh, this at this activity this yes. excitement for the lord yes. up that he's got a word to say this morning yes. but first some quick announcements um choir practice five uh five today we've got um penny back uh do you have a good good vacation yeah excellent excellent so uh, we we welcome you back we're excited um i had to sing one night and we're not doing that anymore whoa that's crazy so <laughs> but no we, we we do really appreciate all of you guys and, and all of your hard work and and for for angie and for pat for stepping in uh that's that's not easy work i tried it that one time that was that was that so thank you guys so much um we have a our building maintenance uh team meeting the date on the slide was wrong that was that said wednesday night it's tonight um, so if you guys come in at five tonight, we're just going to talk about um, some ideas that we have for the building and also where we want you guys to go. I know there's a couple of, of key players that aren't going to be able to be there tonight, but we'll pass the word on to them. But basically, we're, we're, we're putting a team in charge of getting this building back up to where it needs to be. I found out the roof uh, today that the roof is from 1996. It might be time to go up there and, and put some of the hot stuff up there and, and get it sealed back up. So we'll, we'll be we'll be looking into that. And, and again, thank you guys for volunteering to help out with that. Uh, our prayer team will be meeting Wednesday, April 24th at 530. That is this this coming Wednesday, right? Yeah, this coming Wednesday. Um, and, and again, just like this morning, we're just going to be praying for the church and we're going to be setting vision for what the church will be doing, setting vision for the community and for the ministries of this church, because a church can't function if we only function inside our walls. We have to get out and break out into the community. Uh, the next, uh, next, we've got a couple of events coming up. Uh, the first one coming up is on Friday. Uh, this coming Friday, we're having open mic night. So please come, even if you don't want to sing, that's okay. We need an audience too. It's not good to have everybody up here and singing to nobody. I mean, we know we're singing to the Lord, but it's nice to have an, an audience you can see too. So please come, bring your family members, bring your friends. It's a, uh, it, for, for those family members who maybe, maybe are curious and they're seeking, but they don't believe yet. This is a really great event to come in because we do a little bit of prayer. We see, we talk about God, we sing about God, but it's not in your face. It's not kind of the same thing as coming to Sunday morning service. So invite them, bring them along. Uh, we'll have a good time. The next big event coming up is uh, May 25th. We're just about a month out. Um, we're doing the uh, Showing, for, Showing for Christ car show. Uh, yesterday, Kenny and I went over to the uh, car show over at the Baptist Church. It was their, their first one. And uh, we 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 uh, basically hijacked their car show. We went out and handed flyers out for our car show. I did get permission first, so I got permission from their pastor. We went over there, um, and and that's what the church is supposed to do. We're building each other up, and so you know when they have events, we're going to help them out. We we actually help them out with deciding how to uh, judge their show and that kind of stuff. We're coming together as a community, and that's what's important. But the car show is next month. It's a good time. We did we did our first one last year. And there are some amazing vehicles that come out. So please come out and, and enjoy that. Or if you have a car, make sure to enter it. Um, there's nobody really here new this morning. So snacks, all uh, prayer lists, you guys know what to do. It's all out there in the foyer. 
please make sure that you're signing up for the for the prayer list for the monthly newsletter uh, or if you want to bring in uh, snacks on Sunday morning uh, we will be doing that next piece we have uh, two people one isn't here uh, brother Ray's birthday was on April 20th so prayerfully he'll be able to come this evening but Miss Haley we missed you last time so Haley's birthday was on April 8th so if everybody can join me in singing happy birthday to Haley how old did you turn 11 all right all right one two three happy birthday to you happy birthday to you happy birthday dear Haley happy birthday to you all right amen Amen. All right, one more very important thing before we uh, before we kick off the service. Debbie and Graham, can I have you guys come up to the front? I didn't do it. He did. Are you sure? Are you sure? <laughs> How long have you guys been coming to this church? Since 2008. Since 2008. We're in 2024. <laughs> well, I would like to welcome you officially as members <laughs> of you. our church. Getting them decided to take membership in the church. It, it struck me sideways that they weren't members because from the day I've showed up, they've been so active in, in doing announcements and doing every bit of work that they can for the church. And so the, today they join our family and we just want to, we want to praise them. I want to ask that the congregation, everybody that can come up and we're going to pray for them and we're going to come into agreement to support them as they can agree to support us yes. in this continuing mission. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. Well, we always went on to the last they want to visit or after that with your tongue closed. <laughs> <laughs> I was just hanging out with home closed. <laughs> family. <laughs> All right, wait, step, step right here in the middle. We're going to lay hands on you guys. There we go. Dear Lord, we come together here and we thank you for our brothers and sisters in Christ. And we thank you so much for Debbie and Graham. Lord, we welcome them in the church and the church membership, Lord. Lord, and we lift them up right now against any attacks from the, the devil, Lord. We ask your protection. We ask that you put the full armor of God on both of them and that you continue to grow them in faith, to continue and grow them in relationship with you, Lord. Lord, we thank you again for your blessings. And Lord, we ask that this congregation come and surround them with love and encouragement and support. Lord, we invite the Holy Spirit into this relationship. And Lord, we thank you for your praises. We thank you for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. I just want to say, I'm telling you, this church has really done a lot for me. And every one of you are like a family member. I can't wait to get back to see you guys when I'm out of here. You know, and I can't be here like I used to try to come for every service, but I don't come like I did, but I think about you and I pray for you all. I love you all. I'm glad somebody agreed with me. <laughs> Thank you. Uh -huh. Thank you. Too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, <laughs> I would tell you something. You, you, you might think you ain't my friend, but you are. Okay. <laughs> okay. Would you be my flowers? Mm. Flowers are pretty. Flowers are pretty. <laughs> the Lord is is blessing this family. This family is growing. That's a that's a sign. That's you know if you're if you're looking for a sign, that's it right here. Is that the church is growing? People are coming. People are hearing the word, and they're more importantly, they're responding to it. And that's the message for this morning. We're going back into the proverbs, and today we're looking at the two wedding proverbs. So last week. We had the arduous task of talking about taxes. I hope that you guys are all done with that. I hope you got great returns and have great plans for them. But we're done with taxes until next April. Prayerfully, no audits, no nothing else. But now we're in springtime. And springtime is the season of weddings. 
It's a great time. You wouldn't know it today because it's gloomy a little bit outside, but what a great time to have a wedding. You don't even need to hire a florist. Sorry, florists out there, but this is a time of year that you might get a little bit slow because we can just go to the park and see God's creation and God's beauty all around us. It's amazing what happens, what blooms, what comes to fruition when God is in our presence. And so we're seeing that with the church. And this morning, we're seeing that this impactful event is going to have a major impact on our lives I can't imagine a person out there who had a friend, who had a family member, who invited them to a wedding, especially a really extravagant wedding. You know, the rich family member, the one that everybody's kind of like, oh, the wedding gifts are going to be real nice. We should make it to that one. I can't imagine anybody getting the invitation and saying, you know what? No, I passed. I don't want that. I'm just going to go about my life. I'm too busy to go to this wedding. And yet, we as Christians often do that. We're going to go into the scripture. Let's first go into a word of prayer as we go into the scripture and learn about responding. Dear Lord, we just come to you in prayer. We come and we seek your word. As we go into your word, Lord, speak to us. Lord, help us to understand the parable. Lord, help us to apply it to our lives and not to try to apply our lives to it, Lord. Lord, guide us and, and speak to us and show us what it means to truly respond. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're going into the scripture this morning in Matthew 22, 1 through 14. And again, and again, Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son and sent his servants to call those who were invited to the wedding feast, but they would not come. And again, he sent other servants, saying, Tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fat calves have been slaughtered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and they went off, one to his farm and another to his business. While, they, while the rest seized his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, the wedding feast is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main roads and invite to the wedding feast as many as you can find. And those servants went out into the roads and gathered all whom they found, both bad and good. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to look at the guest, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth for many are called, but few are chosen. We have God's word. We have this parable from Jesus. And this one, unlike some of the other ones we looked at, you don't have to read between the lines. You don't have to dig too deep to understand it. The meaning stands right on the face. People were invited. Uh, some chose not to come. Some rebelled. And yet one came and wasn't dressed for the wedding. But we have to be careful because a lot of times we read the parables and we apply them wrongly. Scholars are some of the worst for this, historians especially, because they want to look at this parable and say, well, Jesus was preaching to the Pharisees. This is clearly about the Pharisees. We see that they've been invited, but they're rebuking Jesus, that they had the prophets from the centuries before come, and some of those they bound, some of them they tortured, and, and others they murdered. Okay, we can see that. And then Jesus came, and they missed the Messiah. And so now the Christians have been chosen, and we get really excited about that part. Oh, look, the invitation was spread wide because the first chosen chose not to come. But if we stick with history, we make a mistake. This is a book with a lot of history in it, but it's not a history book. This is God's word, and it's ongoing, and it's a living word, and we need to understand that he wrote it to us. He said this parable to the people he was speaking to, but he had it written down because he was speaking to us. So we need to be clear about who this is about, and it is about us. To understand the parable, we also need to understand a little bit about 
ancient Jewish weddings because they weren't quite the same as weddings today. Yes, there were big parties. They actually did it way more than we did. Their party would last three or four or five days. You got invited to a wedding. You needed to be ready for it. That's the night sermon. But the invitation process was really different because what they did is they would invite, there was an engagement process and that usually happened about a year before the actual wedding. At the engagement, the guests were invited to the wedding and then they had to wait. There was no wedding date set. There was no wedding date written down on the invitation. When you said you were going to come, you were just saying, I'll be there whenever it is, whatever time you yell, I'll come. But what we find here is that when the invitation was sent out, a lot of people just ignored it. They didn't believe it anymore. The people had grown tired and weary, and they, they didn't know if God's word was true anymore. We suffer the same thing today. A lot of people have said, you know, it's been 2,000 years. Jesus said he was coming back soon. 2,000 years isn't soon. What's going on? He is coming back. He is coming back soon. We have to understand that God's timing is his timing. Amen. And it might be 10,000 years. We don't know. But the, the, the big thing to know is, is it might be tomorrow. Yes, and so we need to be ready. We need to be ready to accept the invitation. And so when we look at this, we need to look at it from our present perspective. We don't need to look at it from the historical sense because then we miss the point. And if we try, if a historian ever tries to tell you, oh, it was only about them. Let me ask you one question. Were you invited? The resounding answer in this church should be yes. The resounding answer to, for most people watching, unless they're just searching, should be yes. God invited me. He called me. He put a calling on my heart. I was baptized. I am ready. I want to go to the wedding. Sometimes we miss that. The next thing is, is what will you do with the invitation? Are you just going to sit on it and then miss the day? We need to take action. We need to be ready for what's to come. And we see in the Old Testament, you know, they said they paid no attention and went off and one to his farm and another to his business while the rest seized his servants and treated them shamefully and killed them. When we look at this and we look at it only from the first century, we try to push it off into the past. But how many of us are doing the same thing? When we look at this, there's four different groups of people here. There's the indifferent people. They received the, the invitation and they set it on the counter and said, you know, I'm too busy to worry about a wedding. I have a business to attend to. I have a farm to attend to. I have a family to attend to. I have myself to attend to. I don't have time for spiritual matters. I don't have time to go to church and learn about a God that I can't see and to try to learn about a heaven that I can't even understand. Amen. It's a bridge too far. I can't take the time. Well, my friends, when we do that, when we start worrying about ourselves, we miss out on such a great celebration. Let's put this in worldly terms. Let's put this in a, in a way that, that you receive a trip offer that you can't possibly refuse. You one day open your mail and in a, in a beautiful envelope, you open up and there's an invitation to the royal ball at Buckingham Palace. You've been invited by royalty. Now, if it was me, I'm going to look at it and say, probably a scam. I'm going to set it over here and not that I'm not sending money to the prince in Nigeria either. Don't do it. But then one day a palace guard shows up and says, are you ready? I'll give you time. Pack up your bags. All expenses paid. I'm taking you there. You're supposed to be at the ball tomorrow. I can't imagine that there would be one person in here who would be like, no, I can't do it. I'm too busy. You'd find somebody, you'd find a neighbor, hey, take care of my house. I'm going to England overnight and we're going to have a big royal ball. We're going to have a good time. And yet when we, when we look at this and we see the invitation to heaven, we do the opposite. Our, high, our hearts are tied to the things of the world. They're so tied to the work and the busyness and, and the leisure. Let's face it, a lot of what ties us down is just simply doing this all night, watching TV. We need to be seeking God. We need to be seeking the kingdom so that we have the opportunity 
to chase this invitation down, to be the first to show up at the party. What a sad way to miss heaven, to say, I'm too busy. Amen. He didn't give us busyness. He didn't give us all the anxiety that comes with trying to manage our lives and trying to control every aspect of our lives. Yes. That came from the devil. Be careful who you serve. Yes. Seek him. The second group here is the antagonists. When the, when, the, when the people come, when the king's representatives come to invite these people, there are people there that are tearing them down and in some cases killing them. We've seen it throughout the history of Christianity, starting with Jesus. And ever since then, people have been martyred for the name of Christianity. People have been outcast for the name of Christianity. People have been mocked for the name of Christianity. It's to be expected. When I think of this, I have to think of Paul because he was the first and foremost of these. He went out and initially he was the one who was chasing the, the Christians the most. He said in 1 Timothy, saying is un, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. He was admitting his fault. He was admitting the fact that, yes, he was the antagonizer. He was the one who was going out and murdering and killing and doing terrible things. We have to be ready for that as Christians. We have to understand that we also are the king's servants. We're the ones that are, that are assigned to go out and spread the message. And sometimes when we spread the message, we can expect harshness to come back. Bishop Emmanuel over in Australia experienced that this week. He spoke biblical truth about Islam. And days later, a, a, a terrorist came in and stabbed him. He prayed over that young man. He forgave that young man. That's what we're called to do. Yes. You might find it, and maybe not those violent of terms, but we might find it in the fact that there are some people that when you mention God to them, their face turns red. Yeah. They get angry about hearing the name of God. Have you ever wondered why? Like, why does that even make sense for an atheist to get mad about God? To get mad about somebody that they don't believe in? They don't believe it exists? I might as well get mad at the Loch Ness Monster. It doesn't make any sense at all. But they get furious. It's not because they don't believe. It's because they refuse to believe. Because when you come down to it, when you challenge them with science, they have to escape science just to try to disprove God. There's no way that they can be right. We have to be watching. We have to be careful with these folks because their anger will try to tear us down. Be sure to understand that God is just. And when it comes to those murderous people, the, the scripture is clear about what happens. The king was angry and he sent his troops and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. He's not going to mess around. He's not going to allow God's people to be persecuted and tormented to death. We have the greatest hope that we will see heaven. But they have the, th the biggest thing to fear. It will be more bearable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah than for that town. Scripture tells us that God will exact his justice. Now, for those who refuse to believe, those who just don't want a piece of God, theirs will come too, but it will come at their own reason, at the cost of their own reasoning. When they die, I promise you that they're going to see God face to face, and they're going to say, it's a hallucination. I don't believe it. My mind is doing some electrical activity that's making me see this, and they will deny God to his face. And he will cast them to the outer darkness where they want to go. They want to be somewhere where there is no God and where there is no goodness of God. It's not an unjust punishment. It's not unfair. It's to be expected. We need to seek him and come together. We have the stark warning about unbelief. We have the stark warning about being indifferent. But we have such a great comfort in knowing what is to come the next part is so exciting because the king says well these folks were unworthy send out the invitation to everybody and so we look at it today and we say well we know that israel was the chosen people and that god expanded out 
the, uh, the opportunity, the invitation to every single person. And we get so excited and we should. But understand that if we wind up in the same shoes, he's going to extend the invitation out to somebody else. We can get missed. Be careful. We have to be seeking him. This is such an exciting thing, though, because the scripture says that those people who went out and invited, invited the bad and the good. They didn't care who they were inviting. They found the lowliest low life on the street and said, you want to come to the wedding? And he said, yeah, that sounds good. Okay, come on. They found the most pious person they can find. You want to come to the wedding? Yes. Okay, come on. We're going to fill up the house because the king has, the, the feast is ready. The fatted calf has been killed. If the food's getting cold. We need to fill up the house. Believe this, God is going to fill up that wedding banquet. He is going to bring in his people. And if you choose not to be one of them, it's on you. It's coming to the next person. But we know that we're the chosen. We know that we have this invitation. There's one more piece here. There's one more thing we can't miss. And this is specifically for Christians. Because if we miss this, we're in a real bad shape. When the king came in to look at the guests, he saw there a man who had no wedding garment. And he said to him, friend, how did you get in here without a wedding garment? Folks, this is not about what clothes you wear. I see people debate this and argue over this all the time. How come, the, how come this man didn't have a wedding garment? Did the king fail to provide a wedding garment? Was it too expensive? Why is he picking on this one man? Why doesn't he just put a wedding garment on him? Well, it's because this isn't about clothes. It doesn't matter what clothes we wear. It doesn't matter how much money you have. You can be in this shirt and a t-shirt and cut off blue jean shorts for all I care. That doesn't matter one bit. Because you know what? When God calls us home, we aren't taking our clothes with us. I love all the movies about the rapture and all the piles of clothes are sitting on the ground because all the worldly things are cast off and we go to heaven. Amen. When we get there, though, we better be wearing the right outfit. Yes. When we go to Colossians 3, 12, and 14, it tells us exactly what the clothes are. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. And above all of these, Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Those are the wedding garments. It is possible for people to profess the name of Jesus and claim, I believe in him. I love Jesus. I believe everything about him. But they never put on the clothes. How terrible to be in that person's shoes. At least the atheist gets to deny the fact that there was ever even a wedding feast at all. At least a non-believer can say, oh, I, don't, I don't even think it was there. I'm not going to bother to go. But can you imagine sitting down at the table, getting ready to be served your meal, being surrounded by everybody? And then Jesus comes and says, I didn't know you. You don't belong here. The penalty is great. The penalty says, bind him hand and foot and cast him into the outer darkness in that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. We think of that as sorrow. We think of that as deep sorrow. Make no mistake. When it says gnashing of teeth, that is the anger of the devil. That's an anger towards God that this person got kicked out and then they served the master they've been serving the whole time. They've been saying one thing with their mouth, but they've been doing something else with their spirit. If we don't serve God, we're serving Satan. Be clear of that. It doesn't matter how many times you say, Jesus, if you don't serve him, you're not serving him. There are people who intentionally come into churches. There are witches who intentionally come into churches and they come in and say, I praise Jesus. I love Jesus. They say all the right things, but they're constantly putting hexes on the church. They're constantly spreading an evil fear onto the church. We need to get those spirits out. We need to yes. check our spirits and make sure there's not a piece of darkness in there. Not one iota of doubt is allowed to be in there. We've got to cast it off and put on the wedding garments. Amen. 
What a great reward because there's one more group of people here that fill two positions. The last sentence in, the, in this scripture, Jesus ends on a high note. For many are called, but few are chosen. Folks, we are the chosen. You don't have to watch the show on Wednesday night to know that. We are the chosen. We've been chosen by God. And that doesn't mean some theological idea of predestination where God picks out you and you and you and says, I don't pick you and you and you. That's not the way that this works. God chooses us when we choose him. When we say, Lord, I give you my entire life. I give you my, my whole heart, my whole soul. I bear it all to you. Lord, look me through and save me. When we do that, he says, yes, you're coming to the kingdom. That's what it means to be chosen. That is what it means that we get to get into the banquet hall of glory. But we also have a responsibility as the chosen ones, as having received that gift and all the excitement that we feel in the air when we come in here in the morning, when we feel the Holy Spirit on us, we have a great responsibility. Who did God send to talk to those people to invite them to the wedding in the first place? His messengers. We are messengers. We are the messengers. He's taken upon us and says, yes, you're chosen. You're coming to the banquet, but I need you to invite all your friends. I need you to invite all your neighbors. I need you to invite all your enemies. Go out there and share the word. How did those messengers get treated? But they paid no attention and they went off one to his farm and another to his business and the rest seized his servants, treated them shamefully and killed them. As the messengers, we have to be ready for those times. We have to be ready to lean on the Lord when we've been castigated, when we've been put aside, when we've been ignored, when we've been yelled at. And we have to learn, Lord, I'm coming to my knees and I'm coming to you in prayer for those people who are doing those things. Because, Lord, as much as that person hates me, I love them. Lord, I fall on my knees and I ask that you reach down and you touch them, that you convict their hearts. Because there's many, many people who have taken that antagonistic view, that they're fighting against God. And he's touched them. He's found a way to reach down to them and turn their whole lives around. There's examples all over the world of horrible, horrible people who did horrible, horrible things. And then God touched them. And I can only imagine what the fear and what the re repentance must be like when your life was that bad. And then you get turned around and you get called in exactly the opposite direction, just like Saul got turned into Paul. We've each been there, maybe not to the extent of having murdered people and then being saved, but from the extent of being non-believers, of living for ourselves, of, of living a life where we spoke freely and did all the things that we want to do and we made sure all the people around us knew it do you have family members who struggle to believe that you are a believer i know i do they're like i knew you once upon a time yes you did but i died and i was reborn and the lord has saved me and he's changed me and you know what he can change you too and i don't care how mad you are at god you need to work that out yes because guess what? You're not mad at him. You're trying to control every piece of your life. And who's making you mad is the devil. It's amazing to me. So many atheists, so many people out there, the reason that they're mad at God is because evil exists. Let me get this straight. When that happens, you say evil exists. I can't believe in the God of good. So I'm going to go and worship the God of bad. I'm going to go and worship this devil and I'm going to let him drag me to hell. We see it all the time. One major catastrophe. One child dies. One thing happens. And people lose their faith and they go and chase after the devil. Be careful. Seek God. Yes. Go to him in prayer. Seek for his comfort, for him to lift you up. He has something for each of us. This morning, there's one last question to ask. Will you accept the invitation? Will you put on the wedding clothes? Will you look into your own soul and not worry about everybody else's? This is for you and you and you. It's for me. I need to look at myself and say, Lord, I want to accept your invitation. If you haven't accepted his invitation, 
The altar is here. It's time. We don't, we're going to be talking about this tonight. We're going to be talking about being ready tonight. The time is now. The roads are slick. There's traffic out there. We don't know what's going to happen 10 minutes from now. You have to accept the invitation. You need to come up here. You need to give your whole life to him. Don't hold on to any piece of it. Don't for, don't hold on to any unforgiveness. Give it all to him. Yes. Forgive. Let it off your shoulders. Let it off of your back. Let him lift you up. It's life changing. As we come to the altar, as we close this service, we're going to go into a time of worship. Please come to the altar. If you have something that's there, if you don't want to speak it out, that's okay. Just come to the altar. We'll pray with you. If you, if you need to just stay, sit where you're at and pray, pray. For those of us who have accepted the invitation, for those of us who are ready for the feast, we're looking forward to eating the fatted calf. We're looking forward to all of the glory and the blessing to come. And let's stand up and praise God for what he's given us. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah.